As always, I'm thankful for the opportunity to stand before you and speak once more. If you would turn your attention to history as many of us know it, particularly that which falls within the last hundred years, you think after the fall of Germany, the ending of World War II, and even the wars that have occurred since then, shortly after World War II ending, we had the Cold War beginning. And as citizens of this nation, no doubt, we began fearing Russians, the Chinese, all that goes along with what we term now the Red Scare. Then you think about the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Persian Gulf War, and all the different events relating to these. And then you fast forward to September 11th, 2001, the war in Afghanistan, Islamic terrorism. We have Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and even ISIS, all these different Islamic nations that now perhaps citizens of not only this country but the world are fearing. These different nations rising up and causing terror to whatever extent it might be that would cause worry to those who enjoy worrying, those who love to, to worry about the things they have no control over. Current events fuel that. Now, believe it or not, communism and socialism, no matter how bad they can be and are, are not what we as Christians should be fearing. There are other nations that we should be more concerned about. And this morning, I would like for us to consider some of them as we study the, the scriptures and see what it would have for us to do. So this morning, we would like to consider those truly dangerous nations. The first nation we need to consider is the fact that the church is in danger of domination. Throughout the New Testament, there are passages that clearly and plainly spell out the government for the church. Christ has been given all authority, not some authority, but all authority by the Father. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. As such, he is the head of the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. As that head, he has the right to legislate his will. And indeed he has. Christ is the chief shepherd, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. And within the local congregation of the Lord's people, there are to be elders. They have delegated authority by the chief shepherd. They are to shepherd the flock. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. Now, all too often, a man or sometimes even a woman tries to become a dictator within a given congregation. This individual is selfish and power hungry and would substitute the will of God for their own will. We see this outlined in 3 John, verses 9 through 12. John there pens, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, praying against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them, that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Demetrius hath good report of all men, and of the truth itself, yea, and we also bear record, 
and ye know that our record is true. Too many have diatrophies as their role model. They seek to have the preeminence, and they will attempt to destroy anyone who would stand against them. We should rather have the, the goal to be more like Demetrius, to have good report of all men. You see, there is but room for one dictator in the church, and that is Jesus Christ, our Savior. No other has the right to make legislation or to even attempt an overthrow. But as long as people are people, the church is in danger of domination from the inside. Secondly, the church is in danger of abomination. Christians, or a group of them, congregations, can become something that God despises, is sickened at. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. Too many today are what you could call wind testers. They've got their fingers up in the air to see which way the wind's blowing, and that's where they're going to determine how they go about. Well, if, if the world is saying, let's do this, that's what they're going to go along and do. They go along to get along when, and not be considered that stick in the mud, even though being right would cause them to be hated, despised. Too many men pleasers. We must realize and remember that every, not many, but every wicked way is an abomination to God. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 7. Chapter 11, verse 1. Chapter 15, verse 9 and verse 26. Proverbs 16, verse 5. Chapter 21, verse 27. And chapter 28, verse 9. We must strive to keep the church and ourselves certainly pure so that we, not, we will not become an abomination to God. Now this battle really begins in the mind and it goes hand in hand with a second dangerous nation that is the imagination. For out of the heart the mouth speaketh. Luke chapter 9 verse 45. We can learn of people of old Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 their imaginations were on evil evil continually and then later on throughout the law of Moses we see in Deuteronomy chapter 29 verses 18 through 20 where their evil imagination was was adding drunkenness to thirst you see God hates the heart that devises wickedness Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. He hates that evil heart. We should have the same attitude. All around us, however, we see this same attitude creeping up. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 12, which reads, And they said, There is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices. And we will enjoy, or we will every one do the imagination, an imagination of his own evil heart. Do you not see this running rampant across our country, across the world? Everyone choosing to do that which makes them themselves happy? Forget the fact that there is a divine standard, that is the New Testament, that gets thrown out the window. People are self-willed and would rather do their own will rather than, rather than God's. Unfortunately, the same can be said about brothers and sisters in the church. You see, it is not simply enough to abstain from evil or to even remove it from one's life and even one's mind. In Luke chapter 11, verses 24 through 26, we're given a small painting of what can happen when we don't fill our minds with something good. Luke chapter 11, verses 24 through 26. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places and seeking rest, and finding none. He saith, I will return unto mine house whence I came out. So you see the first step, they cast out the evil, which is a good thing in and of itself. 
Verse 25, And when he hath cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in, and dwell therein. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. You see, we need to occupy our minds with that which is good. Of course, that which is good is God's word. All too often we're so, so striving to, to remove the evil that we are appearing and, and dealing with, but we fail to fill our minds with God's word, to be busy about our, doing our Father's will. And then evil creeps back in. We succumb to temptation. We sang about that a moment ago. Yield not to temptation. It's a whole lot easier to resist temptation when we're furnished with God's word. When we wear the armor of God. Though it is important to stop, or it is important to abstain from evil, we must allow the word of God to direct our steps. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23. Our right way is not the correct way to go. Our right way leads nowhere but to death. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 and, is, and uh, chapter 16 verse 25. Only God's word has the ability to make us pure and keep us such. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. In 2 Tim Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Third, the nation that we should be concerned about is the danger of procrastination. You see, getting people to put things off is one of Satan's greatest weapons. Many procrastinate with becoming a Christian. They'll procrastinate about everything else under the sun. Why not becoming a Christian? We see this in Felix. When Paul preached unto him, Felix trembled at the gospel's message. Acts chapter 24, verses 24 and 25. But he sent him away. I don't want to hear you anymore. But when I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you again. You could not have a more convenient season than the day that Paul spoke to him. But he failed to take up that opportunity because he was a procrastinator. Procrastination is equated with sleep. Romans chapter 13 verse 11. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 14. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2. This verse can be summed up with... When will you wake up? The Apostle Paul there penned, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also, that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not a year from now, not when you feel like it. Now. Now is the day of salvation. Too many times we put off our different goals. Though those things might be important. There is nothing more important in this life than obey, obeying our Savior. Through rendering obedience to His gospel. When will you wake up? Fourth, the church is in danger of discrimination. That's a hot-button topic nowadays. Everybody claims to be discriminated against. Some of it is certainly true. We don't want to discredit that. But this danger lies not so much of the church being discriminated against by the world, but rather within the church, brethren discriminating against brethren. You see, the church is not to discriminate based upon race, social status, wealth, or even lack thereof, or heritage. This is outlined quite plainly in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. 
we should not be showing partiality based on these physical characteristics. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we are all equal. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 29, which reads, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, we, we certainly have different roles to fill. But spiritually speaking, we're all equals. We're all children of God. Why not treat each other as such? Jesus dealt with this when, with his apostles. In uh, Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28, we're given the, the setting there where the mother of James and John asked what I, I dare say many mothers would want for their sons. Success, privilege, status. She wanted the, her two sons to be able to sit at either the right hand or the left hand of their Savior in the kingdom. But as a result, the other ten apostles were indignant toward these brethren. But Jesus there paints the picture and gives us the solution. Again, Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, we must realize our place in the kingdom. We are all servants, and we have no right to take dominion over our brethren. Now, I don't know, I don't think that is what James and John's mother was trying to get at. Again, I think she had good intentions there. But that doesn't mean that was a good result. As we said, the other ten apostles were indignant towards those two. That should not be the case. We are each other's servants. We must take care of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Fifth, the church is in danger of contamination. You think of different sites with drinking water. You have Flint, Michigan, where their water was contaminated. You had four-legged fish and all the different things coming from that. Disgusting water. You have Hurricane Harvey coming in and disrupting the water table. All these houses ruined. That was a lot of contamination. A lot of different disgusting scenarios presented by that hurricane. Well, the church is only as pure as the members who make it up. Pollution is not only an environmental concern. It is also a concern for the church. James chapter 1, verse 27. We have record there in Corinth where they had purity issues. The church in Corinth stood accused of its acceptance of a, of, of a fornicating brother. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. We see that the church there had been polluted, not just of this brother, but also in their partaking of the Lord's Supper. They had contaminated that act of worship. You see, they made it a, into a common meal. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 20 through 21. Many today are attempting to and very well succeeding in polluting the church. 
These brothers and sisters are attempting to live like the world around them. Partially by bringing in the philosophies of men. You have the different beliefs of evolution and how we're trying to reconcile evolution with creation, biblically speaking. Where you have theistic evolution and the different ways that these people try to and are succeeding in perverting the gospel, perverting the creation account as spelled out in Genesis. You have members, or at least people claiming to be members of the church, openly practicing homosexuality, attempting to engage in marriage unions, and saying that's acceptable to God. And then you have the people who are saying that is indeed acceptable to God, who are saying these homosexual unions are approved by Scripture. They are not. It's nothing more than sin. You need not look further than Sodom and Gomorrah to see just how God feels about this unnatural sin. Then you have the whole transgender movement. I've said several times where, you know, why not just burn down this building? I feel like a dragon today, so I'm going to go out and commit arsony. What's stopping me from doing that? I want to be something I'm not. I like dragons. Why not breathe some fire as it might be? People have a very warped view of their reality. In fact, they hate their reality so much, they're going to great lengths to say that you can't tell me what my reality is, and I'm going to hate you for it. And I'm going to try to gain political power so that you cannot speak the truth about that anymore. They're quite successful nowadays, and we're seeing that. You have fellowship issues. People are refusing to withdraw from unruly members those who have unrepented sin in their lives, erring brethren, family included. They seem to forget or not care about the fact that if person A is in error and person B is in fellowship with A, and then you have person A come along, or person C rather, who doesn't even know A, but they're in fellowship with person B, they're all three wrong. They're all three in error. Nobody seems to care about that anymore. It's pointed out in Bible class that we don't draw the lines. That is indeed true. It's told about, about at the Alamo where Randy Travis, or not Randy Travis, but <laughs> he might have been around back then. But a line was drawn in the sand. If you're going to be faithful to the cause of the Texas Revolution, you're going to stand on this side of the line. Well, those who were died, but they died for that cause. And that became a rallying cry for the battles afterward. Remember the Alamo. Well, nowadays it's remember the gospel. Remember your Savior. He died for you. He has a will for us to carry out. And if person A or even congregation A is in error, I as a faithful member of that church, have an obligation to withdraw fellowship from that individual. No matter who says they're right, if we can prove that they are in fact in error. And I am to have no contact with them. Now certainly I should attempt to restore them at every opportunity as that's given. But it's going to alter our relationship. It will not be the same as it was before until they repent. We seem to have forgotten that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. It doesn't take very much leaven before you get those glorious yeast rolls. You see, evil doctrine spreads just as fast, if not faster than that leaven. Because people like to be lazy. They like to be in error as it seems indeed we can look at those around us actually before that we need to consider the ark that Noah built and I think this gets overlooked quite often 
But a main ingredient in that ark was the pitch. The pitch that went in within and without. We might refer to this as flex seal. Genesis chapter 6 verse 14. Noah was commanded to use this pitch on the ark. Well, what purpose did it serve? It was a water sealant. You see, this ark was designed to function in the water. But what happens if water gets into a boat? Well, eventually that boat's going to sink. The church was designed to function in the world. But what happens when there's too much world in the church? It will sink. There's contamination. The purity levels have decreased. All too often we have many of our pilgrims, as it's been said, falling in love with the campgrounds. There is no love for the truth by and large. Next we have the danger of denomination. For those who would love to seek after the old paths, this might not be as might not seem as possible. But it is occurring around us. It is indeed happening. The denominations have been attempting for quite some time to make us just like them. And unfortunately, they're successful. After all, their numbers are increasing. They built a gymnasium in the back. They're having some kind of a, a dance-off on Wednesday nights now. And we just can't compete. Our numbers are decreasing. Our contributions dropping. So what, do we, what can we do to compete? How do we bring back members to the church? So, unfortunately, we succumb to the world, to denominations. And instead of following after the pattern of the New Testament, we follow after the pattern of the denominations. We put on a show. We have folks hoop and holler down the aisles and claim they have the Holy Spirit. Bunch of liars. But it works. It draws crowds. But unfortunately, these crowds are going straight to hell unless they change their ways. The church is plagued with what we would call liberals. That is, those that will loose us from God's commands. They love the thought of being unified with denominations. Because that means more people that they can hang out with and what they would consider fellowship. It gives them more power. And they would, ha they would have to fight much less if they stop teaching the truth and go along to get along. Just believe in Jesus and we'll all get to heaven the same way. Or even different ways. God's going to take care of it all. That's their mentality. Many would have the, the church changed into a denomination through different concepts such as unity and diversity, through contemporary and the traditional worship assemblies. Because, you know, you have to accommodate the older folks, the mossbacks who, you know, would have worship as God would have it. But then you don't want to exclude all the younger generation that would not really care about singing after God's pattern and having true worship. You have different things like polishing the pulpit, lads to leaders and leaderettes. This might be good ideas in, in principle. After all, we do need leaders. We need strong women. But you look at these different public policies and they're, what they're actually doing, it's just a hotbed of error. Consider then what they're all in fellowship with. You think of Apologetics Press. Might have been great back in the day. But look at what they're doing now. Who, in their, who they're fellowshipping now. Nothing but error. And we must not be aligning ourselves with them. Each time it's a step closer to denomination. Then on the opposite side of that, that spectrum... You have those who would bind more on us than what God has already bound. These people are anti-Bible class, anti-orphan homes, possibly follow the saints-only doctrine, and the list can go on. Folks, that's just as sinful as being 
considered a liberal. What exactly does the Bible teach? That's what we need to be concerned about. Not what I feel or I think. What does God say about a given matter? Instead, we should seek to, to maintain biblical unity. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. John chapter 17, verse 20 through 22. This can only be attained by seeking out God's word and strictly adhering to it. And finally, the church is in danger of condemnation. Now, as long as a congregation of the Lord's people is, in fact, doing the will of God, it does not matter what the world might say about that church, that congregation, and it does not even matter what another congregation says about them, again, as long as that first church is doing God's will. Too often, however, we're more concerned about winning the approval of man they're winning God's approval. Due to this, we tend to fear the condemnation of man over God's condemnation. Due to this, all manner of errors come in. Many would love darkness more than they love light. And as such, we can expect nothing more than God's condemnation. John chapter 3, verse 19. We know, however, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that there is no condemnation in Christ. But we must walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. It needs to be a sobering and a basing concept, thought that we must have, that condemnation begins at the house of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 through 19, which there reads, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him, in well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. How do you measure up? Do you stand condemned before God or before men? Because mankind in general is more apt to call evil good and good evil. But we have an absolute standard of authority to follow. It will not change. It has not ever changed. It's God's will for us today. Now many in, in our past, our recent history, no, no doubt throughout man's history in general, have been concerned about what other nations of the world have been doing and are doing. What's Russia doing right now? Well, more than likely Putin there is trying to overthrow America. Is that true? Possibly. Is it not true? That's not my problem. Let's say he does overthrow America. In three years, we're all speaking Russian. Does that change my obligation to God? Does that change the different things that I must be worried about spiritually? No. I'm expected to be faithful no matter what language I'm speaking. No matter who is in Washington, D.C. No matter who's in Russia. Though the Christian can and might be concerned about the different current events of this world, we have spiritual matters to be more concerned about. We must always bear in mind Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not second, not third, first. God should be our top priority in all things. Now, as a child of God, have you become guilty of sin? Whether well, it's the different things that we've discussed this morning or something entirely different. Either way, do you have sin in your life? If you do, repent and confess. 
that you might be cleansed once more from those sins. Or as an alien sinner, why not escape the condemnation of God by obeying the gospel? We read a moment ago that there is indeed no condemnation in Christ. So become a Christian. Live faithful unto death. And that crown of righteousness will be yours when this life in the flesh is over. If you simply need prayers of the congregation to deal with certain issues that you might be facing, if any of these things apply to you, please come together as we stand and sing. <laughs>